Hi, this is Michael Altos, and today we're talking about antimicrobial agents, and this is part one. First, an overview of the principles of antibiotic therapy. The reason we give antibiotics in the operating room is usually to prevent surgical site infection or to treat an already known or suspected infection. We need to be aware of the potential toxic and allergic reactions that can occur when we administer antibiotics. There are two general types of antibiotics, bacteriostatic and bactericidal. <clears throat> bacteriostatic antibiotics stop bacteria from growing and reproducing. This is usually done by disrupting protein formation or DNA synthesis to prevent reproduction. Bactericidal antibiotics actually kill the bacteria. And for that reason, they're the better ideal choice for perioperative antibiotics and for critically ill and immunocompromised patients who may not be able to mount a response and kill bacteria with their own immune systems. Most bactericidal antibiotics work by disrupting the cell wall or the cell membrane of the bacterial cells. We can also break antibiotics down into a different set of categories, and that would be narrow and broad spectrum antibiotics. A narrow spectrum antibiotic tends to be effective only against the specific bacteria of concern, while a broad spectrum antibiotic is effective against many, many different kinds of bacteria. The disadvantage of broad spectrum antibiotics is that there's an increased, of, increased risk of effects on other normal bacterial flora. And this disrupts the balance of bacteria that exist in health in the patient's body. One term you should be familiar with is the MIC, the minimum inhibitory concentration. This is the minimum serum concentration that needs to be present in order for an antibiotic to be effective. When we underdose antibiotics, we have enough antibiotics that the bacteria can sense them, but not enough that they are killed by them. And this can actually promote bacterial resistance. On the other hand, patients who have hepatic or renal dysfunction may do fine with a lower dose because lower doses will lead to an adequate serum level and will achieve the minimum inhibitory concentration. One piece of microbiology you need to be aware of is the Gram stain. Gram's stain is a violet dye that, when applied to bacterial cells, identifies properties of the cell wall. Gram-positive bacteria have cell walls, and they include Bacillus and Clostridium, Enterococcus, Staphylococcus, and Streptococcus bacteria. They have a thick peptidoglycan layer, but no outer membrane. They're more susceptible to antibiotics and antibodies, and often these bacteria are non-pathogenic. The gram-negative bacteria include Campylobacter, Chlamydia, Enterobacter, E. coli, Klebsiella, Neisseria, Pseudomonas, and Salmonella. These bacteria have an impermeable cell wall due to the outer membrane, and they tend to be more resistant to antibiotics and antibodies and are often more pathogenic. Here's a diagram that demonstrates the difference between gram-positive and gram-negative cell walls. Gram-positive bacteria have a single phospholipid membrane, this is the cytoplasmic membrane, and a very thick peptidoglycan layer that forms the gram-positive cell wall. Whereas gram-negative bacteria have the phospholipid bilayer forming an inner membrane, another phospholipid membrane forming the outer membrane, and a very thin cell wall made of peptidoglycan in this periplasmic space. There are yet other ways that we can classify the different bacteria that we encounter. First, we can speak about aerobic bacteria. These are bacteria that require oxygen to survive. We can also talk about facultative anaerobes, which are bacteria that can grow with or without oxygen, and obligate anaerobes, which only grow in the absence of oxygen. Aerobic bacteria include Bacillus and Pseudomonas. 
facultative anaerobes, which are often found in the skin, in the nose, in the oropharynx, the sinus, and the GI tract, come in both gram-positive and gram-negative types. Gram-positive facultative anaerobes include staph and strep, pneumococcus, enterococcus, and clostridium, especially clostridium difficile, or C. diff. And gram-negative facultative anaerobes include E. coli, Klebsiella, and Salmonella. The obligate anaerobes, and also the microaerophiles, which also do best in low oxygen environments, are often found in oxygen-poor environments, like the GI tract or the genitalia. These include gram-positives like Clostridium and Actinomyces, and gram-negatives like Bacteroides, Neisseria, and Helicobacter. All of this really serves mostly as a overview and a foundation for you to understand the concepts as we discuss them relative to different antibiotics. The next thing we should discuss before we get into specific drugs is the concept of adverse reactions. Commonly we talk about allergy as, a, as an adverse reaction to antibiotics. We should be clear that an allergy can occur to any drug. And within antibiotics, beta-lactams and its derivatives are especially known for causing allergies. An allergy is really an immune-mediated reaction. And the effects can be as simple as a rash or pruritus, which is itching, to bronchospasm or even anaphylaxis. Because it's an immune-mediated reaction, which is sort of a snowball effect, even a tiny test dose will also trigger a full-blown allergic reaction. Allergic reactions are immune-mediated histamine release, but we can also have non-immune-mediated histamine release. And there are certain drugs that cause release of histamine in a dose or a rate-dependent fashion. And we'll talk about specific examples of that as we go through our list of drugs. We can still see rash, pruritus, bronchospasm, and flushing just as severe as immune-mediated anaphylaxis. Previously, this was called an anaphylactoid reaction because it wasn't immune-mediated. That's not really a current term anymore, and now we call all anaphylaxis just plain anaphylaxis, and we can subcategorize them into immune and non-immune mediated. The classic example of an anaphylactoid reaction, or what we would now call a non-immune mediated anaphylaxis, could be vancomycin, causing red man syndrome. Of course, there are many other adverse reactions that can occur with these medications, including fever, phlebitis, and many other assorted reactions and side effects. Some antibiotics can cause electrolyte disturbances, especially to sodium. Others can potentiate neuromuscular blockade, especially the amino, aminoglycosides. This can lead to weakness or exacerbation of pre-existing neuromuscular disease or potentiation of neuromuscular blockade that we administer. And many antibiotics cause gastrointestinal upset, especially erythromycin and the tetracyclines. We can see nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, and GI upset due to overgrowth of normal bacterial flora. The most common examples would be a candidal infection, which is actually a fungal infection, and C. diff, which is a bacterial infection. We can also see toxicity from antibiotics. Organs that are commonly affected include the ears, or ototoxicity, this occurs with aminoglycosides and vancomycin. Nephrotoxicity, toxicity to the kidneys, occurring with aminoglycosides. And teratogenicity, which is toxicity to the developing fetus, occurring with a number of different antibiotics. Antibiotics can also interact with other drugs, often due to inhibition or induction of cytochrome P450 subtypes, which will affect the metabolism and elimination of other drugs and antibiotics can displace other drugs from their protein binding sites. The last general topic I want to discuss is the concept of surgical antimicrobial prophylaxis. Why is it that we give antibiotics before almost every surgery? We can look to an initiative called the Surgical Care Improvement Project, or SCIP, which defines this 
initiative and detail. The concept is that delivery of an antibiotic just before incision results in the lowest rate of surgical site infection. And we find that infection rates increase when antibiotics are given too early or if they are given after incision. We want to pick the narrowest spectrum antibiotic that is appropriate for the organisms likely to be encountered during that operation. And we want to maintain adequate antibiotic levels in the tissue the entire time the wound is open in the operating room. For most operations, the standard of care is to give an, I an IV antibiotic shortly prior to incision. The official SKIP guidelines say that the correct antibiotic should be administered within one hour prior to surgical inc incision. That's the guideline, although truthfully, it would be best if they were given within 30 minutes. And if they're given immediately before incision, that may actually be not enough time to establish adequate tissue levels of antibiotic. Nevertheless, the guideline says to give it within the hour before surgical incision. Skip guidelines also recommend appropriate redosing based on the half-life of the antibiotic. And redosing may need to occur more frequently if there's major blood loss and subsequent loss of antibiotic from the serum. Certain procedures, which are clean, may not require antibiotics. And just remember, the reason we're giving antibiotics is to prevent infection from normal flora of skin and the GI or the GU tract. Here's an example of skip guidelines. These may not be current or what your institution is using, but it gives an idea of what a skip guideline table may look like, showing different types of surgery, the preferred antibiotic, the alternative if the patient has an allergy to beta-lactams, or if they have a known history of methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. That's it for this lecture. This is an overview, and in the next recording, we'll start talking about specific antibiotic medications.